Okay, this is my fourth final attempt at presenting BLS resuscitation. Uh, really something you should consider, a, again, more of an overview for your CPR class that you had to take. So as we go through this, we'll look at some of the history in the CPR started, you know, really 1953, 1957. We round up and say 1960 with that. So CPR has been around for a little while. There were some versions of that before. They weren't really called CPR, and we'll see why it's actually called CPR. But currently, there's updates about every five or six years, right? This is what we say if you change your compression, your rate, your depth, allowing recoil, that that's all based on the science. And so the most recent review was conducted by the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, this ILCOR, but they make the changes because they seem to be better. And one of the examples is that is the AED. The AED now, we put that on, it delivers a shock, we immediately resume compressions. It's just they've done enough science that, again, anytime there's some changes in regards to your CPR, they're based in science and, and they're better for your patient. So again, that's why these things happen and why it's so important to stay refreshed on this information. But it is a non-invasive emergency life-saving care right? There's nothing that you really do to enter the body. These are external chest compressions. It's providing the ventilations for your patients. And some of the things we focus on with CPR and as this presentation will go through, airway obstructions, so choking or foreign body airway obstruction, respiratory arrest, and respiratory arrest is of course different from cardiac arrest because with respiratory arrest, they're simply not breathing. Not that that's a good thing, but you don't need to do compressions on someone when you assess breathing and pulse, yeah, they're breathing, yeah, they have a pulse, great, that person we can lay in recovery position. We do a different assessment. Now we find out, oh, this person is not breathing, but they do have a pulse, that's respiratory. And of course, cardiac arrest is when you assess your patient's breathing and pulse, and both of those are absent. So again, just keep in mind, what is respiratory arrest versus cardiac arrest, because they're two distinctly different things. So what BLS does, and again, this is basic life support, that it focuses on your airway, breathing, and circulation. That by the time you get on scene and you start making your assessment, the goal is that you know, somewhere within 10, 15 seconds, you'll be starting compressions on that patient if that is indeed what they need. We say, well, why is that so? And this will come a little bit later on in the slides, but permanent brain damage is possible if the brain is without oxygen for at least four to six minutes. That reminds me of the first review question. And again, I will go through the, the first one of those questions and I'll leave the rest for you. So when, as we do the Q&A time, if something comes up, you can have uh, that information at hand. Well, here it is. The six to 10 minutes, brain damage very likely. Again, this is why there's an immediate, hey, jump on that chest and start doing compressions. Because what do compressions do? Or they actually move that oxygenated blood up to the brain. You know, as far as breathing is concerned, we'll look at different parameters where that becomes more appropriate than others, such as an adult who you witness collapse, not breathing, no pulse. If I can start compressions and have the AED on them very quickly, then really I'm not going to concern myself with doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. You know, in the presence of a mask and oxygen, that may become different. For a child and an infant, you're always encouraged to breathe for those patients if you can. Again, always give them the rescue breaths. But I've gone through these slides since I've done this presentation four times in the last two and a half days and made some notes on there. And as we get to those, I'll point those out because those may resurface again. You may be recalled to uh, ask to recall that information. So CPR, it's in the name, cardio pulmonary resuscitation. So what we're doing is removing the blood through the heart via compressions, and then we're trying to add a higher concentration of oxygen to the patient. It is possible to do that with a bag valve mask, which gets you close to 100% oxygen. If it's a mouth to mask with a face shield and you have that supplemental oxygen port, then you're more likely to get about 55% oxygen to the patient. When you're breathing in via mouth to mouth, then that's about 16% oxygen. Even compressions alone, and again, there are certain times for compression only CPR, but that generates a process known as passive oxygenation. And with that, the patient's still getting 21% oxygen. 
So again, different parameters for different scenes. This isn't, you know, gonna cover all of those in depth. It's gonna review some of the, you know, primary protocols for CPR. So with the steps, and this is really an example of a two-person CPR. If you remember from your CPR class, there were things that called team dynamics, working with a partner. So in this illustration, one has the compressions, the other's providing the ventilations. And something to keep in mind is how often should compressors switch roles, then that should actually be done about every two minutes, right? After two minutes, or if you get fatigued before that, then make the switch with your partner so we can keep those compressions, quote, hard and fast. Now on the basic life support, it is different from advanced life support. That's the paramedic that has a cardiac monitor and defibrillator, right? Different from an AED. You put an AED on, turn it on, follow props, hit the shock button if indicated, but it does all that for you. As a paramedic, they're called upon to look at the monitor, determine the jewel setting. When we look down at the second part here, the fluids, epinephrine, it could be lidocaine. Again, there's different algorithms that we have based on how that patient is presenting on the monitor. And then an advanced airway adjunct would include endotracheal intubation. What endotracheal intubation is, is actually going down into the trachea and that tube sits at the base of the carina. And as you ventilate, both of the lungs are directly being fed with air. When you use simply a bag valve mask, air still has the potential to go into the stomach. It creates gastric distension or gastric inflation. And the problem with that is your patient's more likely to vomit. So nobody wants to get vomit on by your patient. This is the chain of survival that gives you the quick picture guide to this. If you look at the phone, well, yeah, that's activation of an incident and calling 911 right away. As far as CPR is concerned, hey, the patient's not okay, yeah, you should start chest compressions as soon as possible. Even a simultaneous, hey, you call 911 as you're starting those compressions is a good step. Rapid defibrillation, so again, the sooner the AED gets there, the better off your patient is. When you look at some of the studies and the numbers, an AED that's placed on the patient, you know, within the first two minutes can have upwards of a 50% survival rate. That's pretty good, but that's why AEDs are also in grocery stores, in gyms, right? You go to the movie theater or casino, you could see a, uh, an AED there. Those are, if it's not just the employees that are around, you can grab that off the wall and you can put the pads on the patient and determine if they need a shot. When we look down at the fourth link, this is where you may come into the scenario, the basic and advanced EMS. So what that is, is a continuation of the care, but also getting them to definitive care. ICU, an emergency department, the cath lab, whatever it is that that patient ultimately needs, that's where we're going to transport them to. Now this just breaks those down again and actually gives you the words versus just the pictures for it. But I think we cover the chain of survival. There are two different links for the chain of survival. The one that you're looking at here is the out of hospital cardiac arrest or OHCA. There's also an in-hospital cardiac arrest, which focuses more on the monitoring of the patient, having someone who has potential cardiac compromise on a telemetry bed. So again, those things are being monitored. And when they see some of these changes take place, then it's an early access and intervention to the patient. When you look down here, if one, just one of those links is interrupted or you know, absent, then the patient is more likely to die. So think of CPR as a big team sport, if you will, right? The you know, person who's doing compressions may be the one who, you know, woo, I get all the glory for this, but that's just as important as the paramedic that shows up and gives the medication, just as important as the doctor in the emergency room that's gonna you know, work on cathing the patient or whatever they have to do. So everyone plays an equal role in that. Even something as simple as, hey, you call 911, the rest of those steps aren't gonna happen unless you actually have them do that. So again, everyone is equally as important. As we assess the scene, and if you, haven't hit, if you have it handy, maybe you put me on hold right now and you pull back your CPR and AED sheet, right? Just as how this can tie into some of the skills that we do, the CPR, the AED always begins in any scene, will begin like this, where we actually assess the scene, right? Make sure it's safe. When you get to your primary assessment, that's airway, breathing, and circulation. There's 
coming up is the notes on here, what I actually wanted to add to this presentation, but we should all know this. A responsive patient does not need CPR, right? The patient's breathing, has a pulse, and they're talking to you, please don't start pounding on their chest. The principles, and, and this is true, there's adult, there's child, and there's infant CPR, where we always start that assessment by making sure the scene is safe. We always have to check breathing and check pulse of our patients, but although there may be different landmarks for that, an example is of an adult pulse, we check at the carotid artery. For an infant, we're more likely to check the uh, femoral or the brachial pulse for them. But again, we're still checking breathing and we're still checking pulse. It's important to note this down here, and I'd star this, highlight it, whatever you have to do to remember that. But cardiac arrest in adults is typically because of a heart issue, right? The heart stops before they stop breathing. When you look at infants and children, they tend to choke, drown, anaphylaxis, whatever it is that causes them to lose their airway first, and then their heart rate shuts down or slows down or goes into asystole. So keep that in mind about adults versus infants and children. One tends to be brought about by respiratory arrest, and in the adult patient, it's more of a cardiac-related issue. The AED, and the AED is, again, right, we just saw these links are equally as important, but they're all vital links in the chain of survival. But this is truly the device. And if I refer back to the AHA test of what the AED can do, it has the potential to eliminate the abnormal heart rhythm, but that's great, because the only type of, or the only time the AED is gonna work is when your patient's in ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. And those are all times when the bottom part of the heart, the ventricles are beating really fast or just beating out of control. That's fibrillation. And there's no atrial involvement, so there's no, no pushing and subsequently pumping of blood throughout that heart. So we do wanna get the AED there as quickly as we can. It can restore the regular cycle and eliminate that abnormal heart rhythm. Two great things about the AED. If you do witness cardiac arrest, begin CPR and put the AED on as soon as possible. That is in line with that skill station that I was referring to. So for children, Again, it would be ideal to start with five cycles of CPR and then put the defibrillator on that child just because you're returning that oxygen via your compressions and the breaths. Manual defibrillation is preferred for infants to one month, or I should say infants which are classified as at one month to one year of age. But if you don't have it, you can use the pediatric pads, even the adult pads in what's called an anterior posterior position. So we put one on the front and one on the back. The other great thing about an AED is that it only shocks if the patient needs it. So again, fantastic, it's safe for you to use. Here's where they say at the very last part, if neither is available, then use the AED with adult pads on the front and back, anterior posterior, right? That kind of takes you back to medical terminology, but that's why that chapter is so important because these terms start being you know, put into your readings, there's the expectation that you know what those are. So anterior, posterior means just the front and back. I added one of these down here, and that was the patient with a hairy chest. Your AED should come equipped with a razor. Again, you do not have to shave the entirety of someone's chest. There's two spots where the pads go, a couple of swipes with the razor on one and then on the other, right? If you don't have a razor and there are two sets of pads, you can certainly apply the pad to the hairy chest, rip that off, and then you can place a new pad in its place. Pacemakers are fine. Again, the AED only shocks someone who needs it. So as long as it doesn't go directly over the pacer, that's fine. These things tend to sit on the patient's non-dominant side. You know, it might be closer to the center of the breastbone or the sternum. So again, your pads can slide that over just a tad. Wet patients, make sure they're, dry, or they're dried off the best you can. You don't need to dry them from head to toe, but I need the chest dry. I need to make sure they're not laying on anything that's wet either. Medication patches, here, here, this sounds like a test question if I was one, and I might say, how do I remove the patient's transdermal medication patch before 
I apply my AED pads. And of course, that's always with a gloved hand, right? Gloved hand, a towel, something. What does transdermal medication do? Well, C chapter, whatever it is, pharmacology. But there is certainly that potential when you touch that, that that effects of the medication can now affect you. So that's why we want to be careful and always use our protective equipment. As far as positioning the patient, yeah, they need to be on a firm, flat surface, right? If you can't do CPR in the water, you can't do it against, you know, when someone's in the car, I mean, sometimes you have to just try and do these things, but it's always best when you have them on a firm, flat surface. And as far as transporting a patient is concerned, they should be on a spine board because you need that additional, uh, just that rigid surface, because if you just put them on your gurney, then that's going to squish down and it's not going to allow you to firmly compress against the person's chest. The uh, Enough space for two rescuers would be great. Initially, you may only have space for yourself until team members show up and provide some additional resources with you or help, right? If nothing else, just start the compressions. You've called 911. Or if you show up to the patient first, you start the compressions after you determine they're not breathing, there's no pulse. And then the expectation is that your partner is going to bring your additional equipment with you. So checking for breathing and a pulse. Again, these, based on your AHA protocols, are done simultaneously, right? Check breathing and pulse. I put some times in here. It's no less than five and no more than 10 seconds. But when you watch the chest, you're looking for that equal rise and fall of the chest. Don't confuse an agonal respiration which is truly the brain responding to lower levels of oxygen, where it may be a <gasps> kind of a gasp, and you see that once or twice over those 10 seconds, that's not breathing. So when I say breathing, we're looking to see if they're breathing just like you and I are right now. The pulse check, again, this is for an adult, so we do that at the carotid artery. If your patient is not breathing, there's no pulse, immediately begin high quality chest compressions. There's a you know rhythmic pressure to that as you, this is describing the lower half of the sternum. That is appropriate terminology for where we actually want to start our compressions and continue throughout. But when you compress, and there's another picture after this, it's actually, you have to press down, release, it creates recoil. Right? Recoil means as you press down and it comes back, it's just like you're squishing a tennis ball, right? I press down, it might take a second for that to pop back up. It may happen really quickly, but compressions, you need to have the right placement, the right rate, which is 100 to 120 compressions in a minute. Depth for an adult, when we deal with adult patients, it's a minimum of two inches, and of course, recoil. So your hands being placed appropriately, your fingers really don't come into it during CPR. It's the heel of your hand or that strongest part that you have I'm going to tell you, compressions are exhausting, okay? Compressions will kick your butt, which is why we also have that notation in there that you change out whenever you yourself feel like you need to, but try and do it for no more than two minutes. So this is just a setup of your, you can see the heart and the lungs. Someone asked me this the other day about, hey, are we compressing over the heart itself? Well, no, but as you compress down on the ribs, it actually creates that inner thoracic pressure or coronary perfusion pressure. It starts to build up within the body, which eventually that aorta can distribute its blood so it gets up to the brain, which is what we need to feed the most at this point, right? Keep the brain alive by doing good compressions. Here's that other slide I was showing you. Notice that the arms are straight, the elbows are straight. The I don't want to say it's the worst thing you can do because the worst thing you can do is not do compressions at all. But if you can avoid that accessory muscle movement, right, you could see if that person was going down. They're just doing hard, fast compressions. Get the springs out of your arm. You don't release contact from the person's chest once it recoils. You just want to keep that nice. And this is where it goes back to that rhythmic motion of compressions. As far as the airway and when you open and check the airway, two different ways we can do this. If the person's found in their bed or there's no suspicion of cervical spinal trauma, we use the head tilt chin lift. The jaw thrust maneuver is a technique that's utilized to open the airway with a suspected or potential spinal injury. 
if someone falls down and you see them whack their head, the way you're gonna open that airway is with jaw thrust maneuver. Open in the airway, if you determine that the patient is adequately breathing, right, they're breathing, there's no injuries to them, then we can put them in the recovery position. The recovery position just means we're lying them on their side. Why is the recovery position important? Well, if that patient were to vomit, in lieu of them still being back supplying, and stuff goes in and it comes back out into their airway, they can aspirate that. It's just, it's a safer thing to do for our patient, right? We already know this dude's breathing, he has a pulse. Cool, let's just lay him on the side in case he does have this propensity to vomit. Opening the airway, providing artificial ventilations. This is what I added for you, okay? The lack of oxygen and too much carbon dioxide, that is throwing off your balance in your body, which is known as homeostasis. That's a bad thing, right? They're not breathing, oxygen levels decreasing, you're gonna have this increased risk for carbon dioxide. So as you ventilate the patient, and it might be with a bag valve mask, which would be ideal, but it's a nice, easy breath. And most importantly, just until the chest rises. I did replace this. This had uh, terminology on there that said breathe for one second. Oh, there's a whole bunch of different sized and shaped patients that you could have out there. And I got a patient now who is you know, six foot five, 350 pounds. If I'm only ventilating for a second, maybe I don't even see the chest rise, right? What is their tidal volume? But when we go back and just think of how would you deliver a sufficient amount of oxygen to your patient or what would be your key indicator of that, then we would say breathe in until the chest rises, right? It decreases the chance for gastric distension or gastric inflation. Patients not breathing, ventilations can be given by one or two EMS professionals. They can. And this just depends. Are you doing full on CPR at this point or is this simply a respiratory arrest? And if it's a respiratory arrest for an adult, then I want to provide one ventilation enough to make the chest rise about every five to six seconds. But at minimum, use a barrier device with an oxygen inlet port so you can kick those levels up to about 55% oxygen. This is demonstrating the EC technique for the patient. The EC technique allows you to really cuff the bag valve mask. That's my C. And my E are these three fingers that I can hold along the jawline. I mean, we can look at this slide for days, but until you get an opportunity to put that bag valve mask on someone's face or even the mannequins that we utilize, it's just something that requires practice. So it gets, it's probably the hardest with an adult, depending on the size of your hands, but can we use a partner to simply hold the mask while one squeezes the bag? Sure, that's great provided we're not doing compressions at that time, unless you have a third rescuer with you. So a lot of different options for this, but practicing with a bag valve mask is something that definitely takes you a little while to get accustomed to. With the stoma, it's a bag valve mask that goes actually directly over that. Artificial ventilations may add to the risk of gastric distension, but think of the alternative, right? The alternative is you're not allowing that patient to breathe, so we at least put some air over that stoma, and some oxygen is, of course, always better than no oxygen. But here's the illustration. Notice this is most likely a pediatric mask, because you're, I tried it with mine. I was like, okay, I'm gonna give myself a stoma, and then I'm gonna see if I can actually ventilate that. But size-wise, it, it just doesn't fit well. So that's why you notice, if you look at this slide, it does appear that he's using a pediatric mask because a stoma opening is quite small and I don't wanna use that larger mask, which really isn't gonna fit over that space. So one rescuer CPR, and again, this might not be my favorite slides or the way they're set up, but I will tell you any one rescuer CPR is done at a ratio of 30 to two. Okay, so this is when one person is there, they have their pocket mask, or it's your child or your infant. Yes, you should be doing mouth to mouth for those two patient groups in the right situations, as long as you assume you're safe, but it's 30 compressions and two breaths. Any one rescuer CPR is 30 to two. On the two rescuer CPR, it's still 30 to two for an adult. 
okay? So adult two rescuer CPR remains 30 to two. There's only a one, two changes that we have. Two person child and two person infant is actually compressed at a 15 to two rate, right? So two person child, two person infant, 15 to two. Switching rescuers during CPR, right? It's all about high quality chest compressions and avoiding fatigue. That's best achieved if you switch out every two minutes. Devices and active compression, decompression, CPR, awesome. But the impedance threshold device, as I looked at that, and I actually wanted to look this up, that the ITD is a device that's designed to reduce gastric distension and, and work to create a better circulation. They're actually classified by the FDA as a class three, which means that the studies that they've utilized have not shown success over the placebo group. But again, if you ever have a question on ITD and whether or not you should be using it, you definitely should. There's piston-driven devices for CPR. These are mechanical. They compress on the chest at the 100 to 120 rate. There's vests or bands that are out there. I have not seen a lot of these since probably a 2010 EMS Expo. I think they're pretty expensive. It may be best where you have a code 10 or a code 20 truck, which just means there's one or two people that are going out on the rig and they need the additional or the CPR done so others can provide ventilations. Oh yeah, and then one person still has to drive you into the hospital. So it's still good compressions cannot be you know, replaced. We need to jump on those things as soon as we can. And that of course is why manual chest compressions remain the standard of care. For infants and children, again, love this part, cardiac arrest in infants and children will typically follow respiratory arrest. And so what does that mean, right? You don't have a lot of two-year-olds that are running around, oh, I'm having a heart attack, right? Kids have good hearts. It could be something congenital, and that's where it could lead to that V-fib or V-tac, but Primarily, children and infants will go into cardiac arrest because of a respiratory arrest first. That comes up, I guarantee it comes up, so write that down, make note of it. Uh, airway and breathing are the focus of the pediatric VLS. Of course, there's different child respiratory issues. So those are the ones I refer to with the choking, the airway obstruction. So again, just know that is more likely to happen than the kid just having a heart attack. We determine unresponsiveness, and we can even think back, what do we do with the adult? Um, well, we determine if they're responsive or not. Okay, so we're checking the patient, tap the shoulder, or on a baby, you may be flicking the bottom of the foot, more about the Binsky reflex, but we're checking for breathing and pulse. I added this for you, because all it did was say, you know, check the pulse for 10 seconds. Well, as long as, and again, you're meeting the standard through AHA and NREMT, if you say, I'm going to check the pulse for no less than five and no more than 10 seconds. And again, these things are done simultaneously, breathing and pulse check. Good thing to practice when we get into class, if you, it's been a while since your CPR, but definitely comes up on the AED skill station. Form body airway obstruction in children. Yeah. Now, I don't know if I want to say it's common, but it's not uncommon that an unresponsive breathing child, just like we did with an unresponsive breathing adult, is placed in the recovery position, right? Maybe I put them in that recovery position and you have to get for help, right? We're kind of looking at multiple ways you could be responding to a call like this. Techniques for opening the airway, modified for a pediatric patient, the wedge or some rolled towels under the shoulder help keep that airway open due to the child's larger occiput and relatively smaller airway proportionate to the adult. So that's a technique we can show you as well. The infant and child CPR, not breathing and has a pulse. I added this part for you. Just so again, you can have a better idea of what is actually happening. So I assess my child. They're not breathing, but they do have a pulse, right? That equals respiratory arrest. In that instance, it's one breath, just enough to make the chest rise about every three to five seconds. If they're not breathing, 
and no pulse. That's equal to the cardiac arrest, and that's where we're gonna do 30 compressions followed by two breaths. See, when you read this, two breaths after every 30 compressions. So I'm always talking about compressions first, because if, even if you see behind me, this says CAB, compressions, airway, breathing. So compressions come first in all of our groups, but then we can supplement those with two breaths. CPR is a fantastic life-saving procedure. The, the minimal interruptions that you should have while you're providing compressions as well as your ventilations, this is why this works best as a team, right? If you're having, or if you're forced to do compressions and the breaths by yourself, there's naturally gonna be some interruptions there. With a two-person CPR, one does compressions, one provides ventilations, you have opportunities to switch out again at the two minute mark, but where the patient will best be treated, of course, is by advanced life support units and then definitive care at the emergency department. If you don't have ALS available on scene, you know, that's okay, right? You can do the compressions, you can put the AED on, you can you know, do as much as you can, but let's try and get that person to the hospital as quickly as you can. When it does talk about ALS rendezvous, so, hey, I need another unit here. What is your you know, ETA? And they say eight minutes, and you're only four minutes from the closest appropriate emergency department. Well, does that really seem like a thing you should wait on scene for eight minutes, and then we add the transport time to it, that's 12, get them to the hospital. Right? You just have to use common sense on this. What's going to ultimately be best for your patient and its immediate transport? So obviously trying not to interrupt compressions for more than a few seconds is always the goal. And where that comes in is typically when you're delivering your breaths or making a transfer from one compressor to the next. But it's try to avoid interruptions of more than 10 seconds. Right, 10 seconds, we never want to interrupt CPR for more than that. There was some data here also, if you look down the next part on chest compression fraction or what's called CF in the manual, it's the total percentage of time during a resuscitation attempt that chest compressions are being performed. Why is this important? Well, the higher the compression fraction, the more oxygen that gets to the person's brain, the higher the likelihood, and I, and I didn't see this word put into this presentation, but it's called ROSC. ROSC stands for Return of Spontaneous Circulation. So an example down here, and I, and I wrote these in for you, five minutes of CPR, and over the course of those five minutes, while you stopped and gave your breaths, the total compression account or count in that was 300. So that's a chest compression or CF of 60%. On the next one, had you do these things, you know, maybe this is more efficient, maybe you have this with teamwork, it's not difficult to get yourself up into the 400 compression range over five minutes, that's an 80% CF. So it's why it's so important, and even HA has put that focus in there about team dynamics, knowing limitations, and working together as a team. Later on, we do what's referred to as pit crew CPR. I might not be a NAT car guy, but I know someone cleans the windshield, someone fills up the fuel, someone changes the tires. Okay, so someone manages the airway, someone watches the AED and performs with that, and then the other is doing compressions. We may even have a team leader or the ability to trade those people out, right? That's why it was called pit crew CPR. And again, I think that's something you'll see in a little later version of our chapters. When not to start CPR, okay, you come up to the scene and it's not safe, right? That stops you from proceeding with any other call. The patient has obvious signs of death. I think this is back in chapter three, where you may see dependent lividity, rigor mortis, decapitation, burn beyond recognition. Those are times you do not have to start CPR. If there is a DNR, which stands for do not resuscitate, and it's signed by the patient, there's a physical description, it meets all those orange form guidelines. Again, this kind of goes back to chapter three as well with the medical, legal, and ethical considerations. But if you have a valid DNR, then that's a time where you would not have to start compressions for that patient when to stop CPR, and they use the STOP acronym here, patient starts breathing and has a pulse. Well, that would be awesome, 
right? No need to continue CPR if they're breathing and they have a pulse. If the patient is transferred to another provider, equal or higher level of care. Okay? Don't go into TMC and the dude that's cleaning the, the, the room and say, hey, here's our patient, take over, right? That's not transferring to the same or, or a higher level of care. Out of strength, we'll talk about a little bit more, but then the physician orders you to discontinue. And, you know, this is not a willy-nilly type of decision that's made. They've most likely witnessed asystole in more than one lead. They've given rounds of medica medications to the patient. So just know that if the physician directs you to discontinue, there's some rationale behind that. So getting back to the O or out of strength, this means you are physically and unable to go on. You are exhausted. You're not going to be able to do another round of CPR. That's an okay time to stop based on the protocols. Form body airway obstruction. Now, when this happens to adults, it's typically during a meal. With children, they could be eating a meal or depending on their size, because right, child goes from one to the onset of puberty. And a two-year-old may be more inclined to put something in its mouth as they explore and he starts choking on that. But if there is a mild airway obstruction, they can still exchange that air, but there is some respiratory distress, right? The protocols are now, as long as that person is breathing or <coughs> they can still make a sound, then we just encourage them to cough that out. Doesn't mean we're not gonna transport in the interim, but try and encourage them to cough. That's your best course of action for that. The obstruction in the airway, when we have the adult, when we have the child, it's a different protocol for the infant, but we use what's known as the Heimlich maneuver. The Heimlich man maneuver, notice down here at the bottom, anyone older than one year of age. There are other, but again, the Heimlich maneuver is also called an abdominal thrust. So if you've heard it, those change are, the terms are interchangeable. We may also have to utilize something known as a chest thrust. And that's what we're looking at here. We definitely utilize the chest thrust in someone who is pregnant. Or you can't get your arms around the patient's belly. And so when I look at this picture here, notice how she's just pulling straight back, right? It's not an inward and upward motion similar to the Heimlich or the abdominal thrust. This goes straight back and you're simply pulling straight back into that patient. If the object comes out, fantastic. If it doesn't, then we'll proceed on to the unresponsive patient. And this is, you know, it's a little skewed here. So again, I'm talking about initially, I'm helping my patient who's choking and they go unconscious. So for that, I'm gonna go straight into CPR. What we're looking at here is you roll up to a patient, hey man, are you okay? You check responsiveness, you check for breathing and pulse. Pulse is present, breathing is absent. Then we're kind of taking this down that path of a respiratory arrest. So we attempt these two breaths, but they don't produce visible chest rise. Then you're automatically gonna go into your 30 compressions. When you look down at the bottom, attempt to carefully remove any visible object. Okay, only put your finger in that person's mouth if you can visualize the obstruction in an attempt to remove it, right? There's no other time we really need to stick our finger in someone's mouth. And if you turn them to their side, it becomes a little easier. Maybe you can scoop or pull that out. That's great, but if not, we continue back to that 30 and two protocol. Infants and children, again, a more common problem or not as uncommon as we might expect. But if it's an airway infection, you know, it could be something referred to as croup. There's other infections of the airway. But we're not going to dislodge that. Is that just swelling shut? If I'm responsive, standing or sitting child, again, the Heimlich maneuver, also the abdominal thrust. Unresponsive children older than one year of age, it's great. It's the same protocol, the same treatment as we would utilize on the adult. Where this goes and becomes a little different, that's just giving you a picture of the child. Notice how she's on her knee. It's great. It's a little easier to manage them that way. But it is in the infants. And infants we utilize something called back slaps and chest thrusts. It's five back slaps. It's five chest thrusts. But you always want to try and keep the baby's butt above his head so that way the airway is pointed down 
And if that object does become dislodged, it's more inclined to go onto the ground or the floor versus back in the person's mouth. And here's the example of that. Notice that the baby's head's still up a little bit, but his mouth is pointed down. That's what we're trying to do. And if you really pay attention to this, you notice the person's in a seated position. Infants can weigh, what, five to eight pounds at birth. Maybe, you know, that baby looks like he might be 16, 17 pounds. It's a little heavier. So having this expectation that you could always stand up and hold the infant, it's just, it's not realistic. But from a seated position, you can use the, your, your leg or the inside of your leg to balance that infant as you flip them back and forth, performing the back slaps and chest thrusts until the object comes out or the baby goes unconscious. And if the baby now is unconscious, we start CPR, chest compressions come first. Don't check for a pulse. There's no need to check for a pulse. We know what was happening. The baby was choking and it passed out on you. So when we get done with 30 compressions, Again, open the mouth, only if you see something, work to the side and try and remove it. That's what I mean by the same protocols, adult, child, and infant for really all of the CPR, even the choking. Little different techniques in conscious versus unconscious, but if they go unconscious, start CPR and look in the mouth every, after every round of 30 compressions. Special circumstances, opioid overdose, we have a video on that as well, but that's your ability to utilize Narcan as a BLS provider. It's the nasal route of administration is what this is, quote, blessing you for and what your class did. Cardiac arrest in pregnancy still needs good compressions done to the mom, because if you do good compressions to the mom, that's gonna ultimately feed her brain. It's gonna keep the baby going. When you think about rolling someone over in the recovery position, the left lateral recumbent is where that comes from is that baby can actually shift and impinge upon the inferior, the superior vena cava, puts pressure on the aorta. So if we can return them to that left lateral recumbent sign at time of ROSC, or if they're breathing and just seem to be struggling somewhat, we lay them on their side, because the pressure on the aorta and the vena cava actually decreases the total amount of blood available for circulation. So again, and this might be something that comes up in the Q&A period, but if you have any questions about that, note it down and certainly make sure you're asking. The people die, right? And, and when you deal with that, it is a crisis for the patient. It could be taxing on yourself as well. So we're gonna do our best to do what's best for the family members and the loved ones there. Uh, obviously keeping people informed of what's going on during your resuscitation, but if you hand them off at the hospital and they're still working on that patient, right, maybe that's the report you give to the family. We just may not know exactly what's happening at this particular time. Now, as far as someone who has died, talk to the family, right? It's called the cry room or some private place where you can uh, relay this information to the family members. You know, typically, this is going to be done by the hospital staff because they've potentially worked that patient for a longer period of time. But using the patient's name, there are some appropriate terms with this, and that is, you know, unfortunately, the patient has died, right? I'm sorry for your loss. But don't say the patient's gone. You know, well, where'd he go? Did you take him to the ICU? Well, no, right? And that's why oftentimes this works well. Hospitals have social workers. This is their wheelhouse. And they can certainly, you know, potentially do a better job than we can with that. But this is the first part of the review. And as promised, I'm going to take you through the first page here. Brain damage is very likely in a brain that does not receive oxygen for how long? If we think of those slides, right, four to six minutes could be, you know, somewhat likely, six to ten minutes, very likely. So kind of just think back to what that slide presented on it, and you should remember that. Boom, D, permanent brain damage is very likely if the brain with this is without oxygen for six minutes or longer. After 10 minutes without oxygen, irreversible brain damage is likely. Now this is not taking into consideration cold water drownings or hypothermic patients. So one of the bigger things with CPR, right? Don't stop, you, you really can't be dead unless you're warm and dead. So if you happen to be in an environment where it's much cooler, just know there's some you know, different things we may do. There may be some better success rates for the patient. So 
this goes through and again, it gives you the rationale for this, which is awesome. And these may again pop up as quiz questions or test questions, but it's something I wanted you to see. So again, I will put that in every chapter for you, but just the first one, so you can get familiar with that process. But that is 13 BLS resuscitation as question 